the second ship to bear her name, HMAS Sydney would have a short wartime career. Short, but incredibly exciting, seeing multiple engagements with any enemy she could find. For the two years she served in combat, she would see more fighting than a lot of ships that served the entire course of World War II. She would duel with the Italian Navy, fend off German air attack, and only miss the chance to tango with Japan by all of a month. This combat career would, however, be cut tragically short in late 1941. The story of Sydney's final battle is a well-worn one, overshadowed by later events or not. Her unfortunate fate should not, in the end, override the remainder of her life, though. That life began as one of three modified Leander-class light cruisers. These were well-built and generally well-designed ships, though the initial batch had a potential flaw. They had all their boilers clumped together, venting through a single smokestack. Any damage to their propulsion spaces could quite likely disable them entirely as a result. It is this fact that leads into the main difference between the initial set and Sydney and her sisters. The modified Leanders, all of which serving with Australia at some point or another, had their machinery spaces split into two distinct rooms. Visually, this gave them two stacks, the easiest way to tell the Aussie ships apart from the original bunch. Her speed of 32-ish knots on 72,000 shaft horsepower is more or less the same as the other ships, though. This on a hull 562 feet long, with a beam of 56 feet. That is 171 meters long, and a beam of 17 meters. A further contemplated change to triple turrets for the lower super-firing guns did not go through for reasons I'll get into on a dedicated Leander class video. With the only real change out of the way, let's get into what Sydney actually carried. First off, she carried eight six-inch guns and four twin turrets for her main battery. These were supported, at least initially, by four four-inch dual-purpose guns, as well as 12 Vickers machine guns and 14 Lewis guns. Those would be reduced down to three and nine, respectively, by World War II. Her functional armament, she also had some saluting guns, was rounded out by eight 21-inch torpedo tubes and two quad mounts, and a single depth charge rack carrying five depth charges. While somewhat lacking in anti-submarine weaponry of her own, Sydney was the first Australian warship fitted with early sonar, then known as ASDIC. This was mounted in a retractable dome located near her bow. Sydney could thus direct destroyers on attack runs against submarines, but could not directly participate herself past those five depth charges. Finally, she carried a single scout plane between her two funnels. Right, with the raw stats done. Sydney was laid down on July 8, 1933. Her construction would progress fairly quickly, seeing her launched on September 22nd of the following year. It should be noted, prior to her launch, she was known as HMS Phaeton, intended for the Royal Navy. The Australians, having had decidedly mixed results with home-built warships, purchased the cruiser on the stocks. There are several reasons for this, ranging from lack of proper shipbuilding industry at home, war clouds getting heavier every day, and just not having proper shipwrights to build such a modern ship. The most likely answer, though, is that building HMS Adelaide, a much simpler ship, had taken seven years to complete. Regardless, HMS Phaeton would be renamed to HMAS Sydney and commissioned into the Royal Australian Navy on September 24, 1935. She would not actually see Australia for some time yet, though. After her sea trials were complete, the ship was detoured on her way home by Mussolini throwing Italy headfirst into Ethiopia. The resultant crisis would see Sydney assigned to Gibraltar to reinforce the Royal Navy. Specifically, she joined the 2nd Cruiser Squadron, serving in the Mediterranean for a bit. This was her first taste of active service, service with the Royal Navy, and service in the Mediterranean. 
all three of which would prove useful to have for the future. That being said, after spending time helping sanction Italy, Sydney would set back off for Australia on July 14, 1936. Her crew were probably quite happy about this, having spent a long time away from home, and fought off disease outbreaks during her time taunting Italy. In any event, Sydney arrived in Australia in late July. As could be expected, the cruiser would receive a lot of well-wishers during her early port visits. She was the newest and greatest ship in the RAN at the time, and something of a novelty. Her sleek, modern lines quite unlike her namesake, or the previously mentioned Adelaide. Darling of her nation or not, Sydney would soon be sent out on the usual peacetime rotation of training exercises. At least until 1939 rolled around, and as most people watching this video probably know, World War II kicked off. While the Australians had placed their navy at the disposal of the Royal Navy, as necessary, this came with a stipulation. No Australian warship, excepting HMAS Perth, already in the Atlantic, could be pulled from Australian waters without prior clearance by the Australian government. As such, Sydney would remain around Australia at the start of the war, doing convoy escort and patrol missions. During this period, she would gain a new commanding officer, one Captain John Collins, who had served previously as her executive officer. Collins was the first Australian officer to command Sydney, and something of a perfect choice, as many of the crew had previously served under him. Welcomed back with open arms, he would lead the ship through her following Mediterranean service. Before that, though, more patrol work. With Japan neutral, though very much not friendly, Sydney had a fairly quiet time in those early days of the war. She would patrol out into the Indian Ocean or along Australia's massive coastline, not once running into hostile action. Trading places occasionally with other Australian cruisers, the furthest she would get from home would be escorting convoys carrying Australian and New Zealand troops towards North Africa. It wouldn't be until May 1st, 1940, that she would leave Australian waters and head towards her first proper combat service. She first stopped off at Singapore to refuel, then set off for Ceylon. This duty in Ceylon would prove short-lived, though, because by mid-May, she was reassigned to the Mediterranean fleet, arriving in Alexandria on May 26th. Now, while assigned to the Mediterranean fleet, Sydney was originally earmarked for service in the Red Sea, continuing to escort convoys to and from Suez. However, Admiral Cunningham, always independently minded as he was, grabbed her for proper Mediterranean service. He was fond of Australian destroyers and how they had performed, and evidently decided he wanted an Australian cruiser as well. Thus would Sydney be assigned to the Royal Navy's 7th Cruiser Squadron, and see her hard-fought career really begin. While establishing her reputation as an efficient ship, Sydney would be serving with the British when Italy jumped into the war for their place at the table on June 10, 1940. Within a few hours of that, early on June 11th, the Mediterranean fleet set out on patrol. It didn't take long for actual combat to follow. A submarine was reported on the surface and attacked by the destroyer HMS Decoy. While the British couldn't confirm the fate of that submarine, another submarine would succeed in sinking the antique cruiser HMS Calypso off the coast of Crete on June 12th. First confirmed blood here to the Axis. Sydney would join her British and French allies in turn in bombarding the Libyan port of Bardia. Here, Sydney's floatplane would provide scouting support, though this task would see her jumped by biplanes. Reported as Italian at the time, but quite possibly gladiators that misidentified the Australian plane. Regardless, through heroic efforts, the pilot, Flight Lieutenant Price, would manage to land his shot-up plane safely. Sydney's return to port would be no less exciting, because France signed an armistice with Germany on June 22nd, the terms of which included the French fleet returning to France, to be demobilized under Axis supervision. Rightly worried about this functionally meaning the ships being divvied up between Germany and Italy, though the French certainly didn't intend that, 
the British acted to prevent this. In Algeria, this would end in tragedy when miscommunications and misunderstandings saw the Royal Navy fire on their erstwhile allies, causing immense destruction on the French fleet. In Alexandria, Sydney would be one of several ships training her guns on their former allies. Unlike in Algeria, however, this would not end in tragedy. While certainly a tense situation all around, the French would eventually agree to Cunningham's demands. The French ships were demilitarized and interned in Alexandria's harbor. This included the battleship Lorraine, so perhaps Sydney was lucky to be able to turn her guns away from the French and not be drawn into a shooting fight. The rest of June would see more of the same missions, convoy escorts at least at first. Until the 28th, that is. This would see the battle with the Bray destroyer Espero, which I have already done a video covering. I'll link that in the description, but the brief summary is as follows. Three old Italian destroyers were sighted by the British. Several light cruisers, including Sydney, were sent after them. While two of the Italian destroyers fled under smoke, Espero, damaged and not able to keep up, remained behind to cover her sisters. While fighting an ultimately doomed last stand, the Italian destroyer would embarrass the Commonwealth forces attacking her. The Australians and British would fire 5,000 six-inch shells, all to sink one destroyer. Sydney would be the one to finish the job, though not before Espero gave one last defiant attempt to shoot back. That missed, and Sydney fired a few salvos to finish the destroyer off, leaving one of her own boats behind for the survivors after picking some of them up. Survivors who were actually quite keen to remain aboard the cruiser treated far better than they were expecting in a prisoner of war camp. Such was the amount of shells fired that morning would show Sydney's guns stripped of their paint. The first, but not the last time, this would happen to her. On returning to Alexandria two days later, Sydney would be coming under air attack from Italian bombers. Something that would happen quite often, really, to the point that Sydney, never suffering damage, became something of a lucky ship. There's a story here from July 1940 of Admiral Cunningham watching Sydney vanish behind plumes of water kicked up by a particularly heavy bombing attack. He signaled Sydney, asking if she was all right. Collins sent back, I hope so. Typical dry Aussie wit there. Once she was back at sea in July, Sydney would, along with her fellows in the 7th Cruiser Squadron, engage a high-flying bomber. They would expend a fair bit of ammunition for no result, probably frustrating the crews quite a bit. They might have been less frustrated and more deeply embarrassed upon discovering they had joined the club of warships attempting to shoot down a planet. The bomber turned out to be the planet Venus. Embarrassed or not, Sydney would soon be in action against an actual enemy in the Battle of Calabria. That took place on July 9th, and while Sydney would be in the thick of it, she would neither deal much in the way of damage, nor take damage in turn. She would fight the cruiser screen, along with the rest of the British cruiser screen, but in spite of her best efforts, Sydney would only manage to damage an Italian destroyer. The more severe damage that war spite dealt to the Italians would rather convince them to retreat. For her part, while Sydney took no damage, she had managed to expend all her anti-aircraft ammunition between the planet Venus and actual Italian aircraft. With her defense now reduced to the machine guns and some annoyed Australian riflemen in her spotting top, Sydney would return to Alexandria to rearm. At least she still had her main battery, having only expended 400 rounds of 6-inch ammunition. Leaving Alexandria on July 18th in company with the destroyer HMS Havoc, Sydney would join up with more British destroyers in the Aegean. Her orders were fairly wide-ranging here to patrol for enemy shipping and interdict it, while also carrying out anti-submarine sweeps around Crete. These are fairly complementary missions, insofar as a ship searching for enemy shipping can just as easily hunt for submarines. The issue was in how far away Sydney was expected to be from the destroyers doing the sub-hunting, making it a bit more difficult to actually support them. Collins, realizing this, chose to keep Sydney close to the destroyers, 
to protect from enemy attack, and provide actual support. It was a prudent move, though not in regards to submarine hunting. Those destroyers would pick up two Italian cruisers rapidly hauling up on them. Wisely turning away, the British destroyers ran away from the Italians, who, as Condottieri class cruisers, were very fast in their own right, certainly faster than Sydney. The commander of the destroyers assumed Sydney was far away on her own hunt shipping task. As it turned out, both the British and Italians would be surprised by just how close the Australians actually were. Collins maintained radio silence as he approached the action to keep surprise going. He would get his surprise. Sydney would jump the Italian cruisers and promptly open fire on them a few minutes after sightings were made. The first target was hit by gunfire and decided discretion was the greater part of valor. She hid in a smokescreen as Sydney shifted fire to her consort. Now here I'll note the Italians got the speed for these ships by means of basically sacrificing every last bit of armor. They were basically massive destroyers for all the protection they had. It should be little surprise then that the other cruiser was quickly crippled. Coming to a halt with her engines wrecked, the British destroyers would torpedo her and sink her, finishing her off while well, Sydney would attempt to chase the other Italian cruiser, which went about as well as you could expect. Sydney was fast, but nowhere near fast enough. The Battle of Cape Spada would end with Sydney only taking a hit to her forward funnel, though she managed to fire off almost all her ammunition again, and strip paint off her guns again. All this being said, her remaining time in the Mediterranean was decidedly less eventful. Sydney would return to the traditional escort missions, interspersed with the odd, different task. She helped sink a tanker supplying Italian bases. She would return to Alexandria and get a new paint scheme, before promptly deciding to disguise herself as an Italian cruiser instead. On the night of September 3rd, the cruiser, thus disguised, would bombard an Italian airstrip before returning to the fleet. This disguise was perhaps a touch too good, considering the British nearly opened fire on her before she raised her proper flag and cut away to the skies. Despite her best efforts, though, Sydney would not get to fight the Italian fleet again. She even sailed as part of a decoy force during the Toronto raid, and still managed to not get into a surface action. Her last gunfight with the Italians would involve sinking some hapless merchantmen and damaging a destroyer far from her most famous actions. So it would be that, in January 1941, Sydney would return home to Australia, escorting convoys along the way. Sydney would end up missing the evacuation of Crete as a result, which is probably fortunate for her, all things being equal. The Royal Navy bled badly in that particular operation. For her part, Sydney badly needed a refit. She had been fighting practically non-stop, and the ship was just plain worn out. This is part of why she returned to Australia. Though not all her crew would return with her, some of them being sent off to help man new destroyers for the RAN instead. These men would end up being... lucky, as we'll find out. In any case, Sydney would return home to a hero's welcome, having only lost one man during her entire time in the Mediterranean. And he died from disease, not Italian or German gunfire. Cindy's 1941 would, from here, be pretty boring, all told. Considering her 1940, that wasn't a terrible thing. She would do many patrols and escort missions, but not find any action. In spite of attempting to track down German merchant raiders, such as the Atlantis, during this period. That one of her main missions was hunting down surface raiders would... Well, let's talk about how her 1941 ended. The following comes from the survivors of her final foe, as none of Sydney's crew would survive this final engagement. On the afternoon of November 19th, 1941, Sydney approached a suspicious merchantman. The ship was flying a Dutch flag about 130 miles west of Shark Bay, off the northwest coast of Western Australia. The merchant would fire off cries for help, claiming to be the Dutch merchant Strat Malacca, fleeing from an armed merchant raider. 
Sydney would approach warily, attempting to close the range to get a better look. All the while, she attempted to get a proper code response from the Dutch ship. The crew of the merchant, as it turned out, would not have such a code. Not because they hadn't received it, but because they weren't Dutch at all. This ship was the German raider Cormoran, bearing the name of a World War I ship, just as Sydney did. When Sydney hoisted a two-signal flag, IK, the Germans had no idea how to respond. This was, in fact, two letters of the actual Strat Malacca's secret identification code. Sydney signaled, in plain language, show your secret sign at this point. Through all of this, while wary, the cruiser drew ever closer. Her guns were trained on the Cormoran, and her scout plane was warming its engine on the centerline catapult. With it impossible to keep up any kind of ruse at this point, Cormoran threw off her disguise. Down the Dutch flag went, and up went the German naval ensign. This was traditional practice. It was a war crime to fire without warning, or under a false flag. Raising the flag was all the warning needed to adhere to the laws of war. It was, tragically and obviously, nowhere near enough warning for Sydney. At around a mile away from each other, the two ships opened fire on one another. Caught largely by surprise, Sydney's first shots missed, flying high. Cormoran, expecting the engagement, was far more accurate. Her first salvo wrecked Sydney's bridge and fire control. Cormoran would continue firing rapidly at the cruiser, focusing all her fire on Sydney's bridge, torpedo tubes, and secondary battery. Armed with six 15cm guns, two 3.7cm anti-tank guns, and five 20mm cannon, Cormoran was not that far off from Sydney's own firepower. The rapid-firing cannon would keep the cruiser from using her secondary guns, relegating this to a duel between the main guns. Cormoran would also fire two torpedoes. Sydney's bow turrets were fairly quickly shot out of action. Her stern turrets would continue firing, though only one of them would land any hits. Even in local control, the range was so close that Sydney's X turret was able to fire fast and accurate salvos, hitting the German raider in her funnel and engine room. The Y turret, meanwhile, only fired two or three salvos that all missed. At some point or another during this, one of the two torpedoes the Germans had fired hit Sydney under her foremost turrets. The other missed, but that single hit is most likely what doomed Sydney in the end. She swung towards Cormoran, though how much this was intentional and how much of it was due to some form of damage, not exactly clear. It brought her functional pair of guns out of firing position, while Cormoran landed a hit that blew the top off her B turret. Sydney's as yet unengaged starboard torpedo launcher managed to get off two torpedoes, but both would miss. Cormoran was not a warship and had been crippled by the initial hits from Sydney's X turret. Those had wrecked her power plant and started fires that would eventually doom the raider. Fortunately, Sydney was doomed as well. She would drift off towards the south, ablaze from stem to stern. The Germans would continue to see a distant glare of these fires until around midnight, though their last firm sighting was when the cruiser was about 10 miles away. After midnight, all trace of the cruiser was gone. Cormoran would, in turn, sink around 1.30 in the morning when her mines exploded. Over the following days, while Sydney was searched for in vain, 318 of Cormoran's crew would be picked up. None of Sydney's would survive, leaving us with only the German account of the battle. All that would ever be found of Sydney, at least at this time, would be a single life raft found adrift, and later, a second raft washed ashore on Christmas Island in February 1942. That one was carrying a single body, identified in 2021 as Thomas Clark, the one and only man ever found of Sydney's crew. As for Sydney herself, she vanished without much of a trace, and her wreck would only be found after many, many failed tries in 2008. Sydney's wreck is a shot-up mess. Her turret shot to ribbons, and her bow broken off. 
If there was ever any doubt that the ship had lost the gun duel, her wreck definitely puts that to rest. Still, there is a certain level of controversy over her sinking. The idea that an armed merchant ship could sink a modern cruiser? It's hard to believe if you don't know the full story. The plain fact of the matter is that Sydney was a light cruiser. Her armor wasn't going to keep out fire at functionally point-blank range from a ship that was really armed almost as well as she was. That she got that close at all is something of a mistake, but one will never know the reason for. The simplest explanation is that her new captain just wasn't experienced enough and got too close to try and figure out what was going on instead of keeping his distance before confirming things. In so doing, he lost every advantage Sydney had while handing the Germans every advantage they needed. No matter what actually happened that day, the end result is the same. HMAS Sydney's legendary luck ran out, and her crew paid the ultimate price. Her fate would serve as a lesson that, perhaps, saved any other ships from suffering the same fate. Little comfort that may be to those she and her crew left behind. Thank you for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoy the content, and I'll see you in the next one.